or we'll sing that song. <laughs> you know what's great? This means Susan's been with us long enough that she knows our routines. <laughs> That's all right. Terrence Crutcher, Keith Scott. Two more black men killed by police this week. Refugee children and mothers and grandmothers and fathers and grandfathers compared to a bowl of Skittles. Did you guys hear that? This week, Donald Trump Jr. tweeted a picture of a bowl of Skittles that said, if I had a bowl of Skittles and told you that just three would kill you, would you take a handful? That's our Syrian refugee problem. And this week, a person on Facebook, Eli Bosnick, posted a response that went viral. He said, are the other Skittles human lives? Is there a really good chance I would be saving someone from a war zone and probably their life if I ate a Skittle? He says if that's the case, he would gorge himself on Skittles. And if he died, he'd leave behind a legacy of children and friends who also ate the Skittles until all the Skittles were gone. Because the real question behind the inaccurate, insensitive, dehumanizing, racist little candy metaphor, Bosnick says, is, is my life more important than thousands upon thousands of men, women, and terrified children? And what kind of monster would think the answer to that question is yes? Others pointed out that the odds of being killed by a terrorist are actually one in 20 million, not three in however many Skittles fit in a little bowl. So if you're worried about your own likelihood of death, you might consider giving up driving cars, removing all the furniture from your home, or supporting diabetes research. Because cars, fluke furniture accidents, and diabetes are all way more likely to get you. And who knows? Maybe the refugee you befriend will give you the Heimlich one day. <laughs> Why do we place some lives above others? And how did it come to be so closely correlated with race? Because race is, after all, imaginary. It's an illusion. Obviously, people look different from each other. We see this every day with our own eyes. But we humans are not, and never have been, organized into distinct races. We are accustomed to thinking we are, right? Black, white, Asian. Hispanic or Latino is not a race, but many people think it is. And a particular look comes to mind when we say any of these words. But think about it. In reality, if you were to travel across land from sub-Saharan Africa to Egypt to Greece to Scandinavia, what you would see is a gradual change in skin tones. The farther north you go, the lighter skin typically is. The closer to the equator, the darker. In between, skin tends to be in between. There's an array, basically a color wheel, not a set of just a few skin colors and hair types and eye shapes. Not only that, people are always intermixing, and they always have. Attempts to classify races with subcategories inevitably end up breaking down into chaos. Several years ago, when I went to register my son for middle school, I was asked to check a box, white or Hispanic not white. Neither of those was a good fit. I am what we call white. My husband is what we call Hispanic not white. My son is both and neither. I returned the form to the school receptionist. You have to check a box, she said. I can't, I told her. Where do these racial categories come from? It used to be that when people spoke of races, the notion wasn't tied to skin color at all. On the European continent, for example, people used to think of each other as different races. There were tribal names, the Scythians, the Celts, the Gauls, the Germani, the Saxons. Later, there were the Greeks, the Romans, the Franks. Races were tied to place and culture, not color, even though color differed. Likewise, looking beyond Europe, Ancient Greeks spoke of place and believed skin color was just influenced by location. The Greeks themselves, after all, were darker than their neighbors to the north. Of course, humans have always found ways to dominate and to oppress and to enslave each other. But the word slave comes from Slav, people of Slavonic tribes who were taken prisoner by Germans and sold to Arabs in the Middle Ages. Slavery wasn't based on skin color 
and people didn't think of races that way either. The idea of race, as we know it today, here, developed in connection with the founding of the United States. In particular, it had to do with American slavery challenging the young country's reputation as the land of the free. Now, you might be surprised to hear that at first, the kind of slavery and freedom that occurred here had nothing to do with skin color either. The first US census counted free white males over 16, free white males under 16, free white females, all other free persons by sex and color, and slaves. It specified free white people because not all white people were free. In the early years of the colonies, before Africans were dragged to North American shores, much of the labor was done by indentured servants. 100 to 130,000 of the Englanders who came to America were indentured servants, people who were not free until they had purchased their freedom by working off a debt. Now, indentured servitude is not exactly the same as slavery because, theoretically, it wasn't lifelong and it wasn't inherited by children, but indentured servants weren't free. They didn't have the same rights as others, and additional time could be added to their tenure if they violated any rules. For example, getting pregnant. And you can imagine how vulnerable a young woman in that situation would be to sexual assault. Most telling of all, though, was the harshness of their lives. Two-thirds of indentured servants died before achieving their freedom. So much for not being a lifelong term. Colonists tried enslaving Native Americans. They desperately needed their farming expertise and more workers, but they were hard to track down when they escaped, disappearing as they could into the local population. With slaves from Africa, though, Virginia colonists found a group of people they could easily track. Africans and their children who inherited their slave status could not easily blend into the landscape of lighter-skinned European descendants, Native Americans, and others. Still, despite the apparent contrast of light-skinned people and African slaves, peoples who we now think of simply as white did not think of themselves as one group, not even close. Those who claimed English heritage, for example, often compared the Irish to apes, not only in behavior, but in appearance, and they drew caricatures accordingly. The influential Scottish essayist and philosopher Thomas Carlyle described them as a race of people designed to be dominated. Those same kind of comments would later be made against black people. Frederick Douglass, who bought his own freedom from slavery and went on to become one of the great public intellectuals of our nation's history, visited Ireland during the famine of 1845. And even he compared the Irish to enslaved blacks in America, describing their similarities both in behavior and physiological appearance, right down to the shapes of their foreheads, ankles, and feet. Similarity or dissimilarity was more about status and perception than skin color. But you know who didn't buy that comparison? The Irish. <laughs> Seeking to distance themselves from blacks, they supported the pro-slavery Democratic Party, and they spoke out against black people. Meanwhile, the Irish reframed their Celtic-Irish cultural history with pride, using, ironically, some of the same logic against the English, who identified as Saxons, that abolitionists would use against slavery. Saxons, they said, were natural-born thieves who violently oppressed other people with a level of savagery that blatantly contradicted their self-image as civilizers of the world. Their behavior was their own evidence against them. Meanwhile, it wasn't just the Irish who were excluded. In 1848, commenting on a failed Hungarian revolution, Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, the Paddy period lasts long. Hungary, it seems, must take the yoke again, and Austria, and Italy, and Prussia, and France. Only the English race can be trusted with freedom. Light-skinned people had been sorted according to heritage and social status. At that time in the US, indentured servants worked alongside slaves of African descent, socializing with them and even marrying them. For people in power, 
this was becoming a problem. If oppressed peoples got together, they might stage an effective uprising. So a concerted effort was launched to make light-skinned people see themselves as better than dark-skinned. Also at that time, the existence of slaves in America was becoming hard to reconcile with our reputation as the land of the free. As the anti-slavery movement grew stronger, the pro-slavery side had to come up with new arguments. Inspired by Thomas Jefferson's reflections that there surely must be a deep down fundamental difference between black and light-skinned people, they turned for proof to science that Africans were naturally destined for oppression and that they were inherently inferior not only to the English, but to all whites. This is when the modern idea of race was born. The idea of race as biologically distinct groups of humans, evident in skin color. For the next 200 years, scientists studied black bodies intensely, measuring heads, ears, feet, and more, and publishing a heap of damning articles. Their opinions were compelling enough that the so-called science that white Americans developed was later used by the Nazis to support the Holocaust. But for all their effort, they never actually found any proof. What about Native Americans? Where do they fit into the racializing? In his famous work, Notes on the State of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson described Native Americans as being like whites. He admired how they had fought for their freedom and land. The problem, he said, was culture. They had not been civilized. In order to avoid an Indian war along the entire frontier, whites set out to civilize them by converting them to Christianity and sending their children to boarding schools. Richard Allen, a policy analyst in the Cherokee Nation, says, the civilization policy was to make us brown white men. Obviously, race categories have changed over time. Mexicans, too, were classified as white until 1930. A Mexican or Mexican-American person who is 86 years old or older has had their race changed by our government during their lifetime. Another example of, yo no crucé la frontera, la frontera me cruzó. I didn't cross the border, the border crossed me. And during Jim Crow, the legal definition of black was left up to states. In one state, having one black grandparent was enough to make you black. In another state, there was a one-drop rule. Any African-American ancestry at all would do it. So you could literally cross a state line and change races. I want to return for a moment to the racial battle that had ensued within light-skinned America, and especially to Ralph Waldo Emerson. Emerson was vocal in his opinions about these things, strongly favoring the Saxons, the English, over all others. We tend not to be familiar with these writings of his. We're more familiar with him as a lover of nature, a critic of American society, and a father of transcendentalism. He was deeply influenced by philosophy from India, particularly the belief that all is one. In his essay, The Oversoul, he wrote these beautiful words. Within man is the soul of the whole, the wise silence, the universal beauty, to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one. We see the world piece by piece as the sun, the moon, the animal, the tree, but the whole of which these are shining parts, is the soul. Although he abandoned the Unitarian faith, Emerson had a profound influence on our tradition. The existence of an interfaith mural in a Unitarian Universalist church can be traced in part to Emerson's theology and his curiosity about world religions. His words are among the readings in the backs of our hymnals. And yet, for all of his words about the unity of all things, what we don't remember about him is that when Emerson spoke of Americans and wrote so eloquently about their place in the world, what he really meant was a particular kind of white men. I wish we could say that he was merely a man of his times, not enlightened enough to rise above the era. But he helped to shape the ideas of those times, not only denouncing Austrians, Italians, Prussians, and the French, as in his words that I shared a few minutes ago, but also black people. He was against slavery, but he was for racism. In particular, he elevated, and at length, the English ideal of beauty. Tall, blonde, 
with a red and white complexion and blue eyes, norms of white beauty, white norms of beauty, that we still see dominating fashion magazines today. Norms I aspired to as a little girl, how I wished I could be taller. But my people were Irish. <laughs> Emerson wrote a book called English Traits and essays called Genius of the Anglo-Saxon Race and Traits and Genius of the Anglo-Saxon Race and the Anglo-American. Ouch. Nell Irvin Painter, Emerita Professor of American History at Princeton, calls Emerson the philosopher king of American white race theory. Let us build not just monuments to the good works of our heroes, but movements from their failures. Here's what we know now, friends. We know now that we all come from Africa, and that while ethnic heritages that developed across the globe over the 100 to 200,000 years since created an amazing array of diversity, race, as distinct categories of people, is not real. No significant genetic difference exists between people of different races. Thanks to science today, we know now that there is no marker that people of a certain race share and that others outside their race don't have. No such thing exists. And we know that your DNA differs as much from someone within your race as it does from someone of another perceived racial group. And you are as much of a match for someone within your group as for someone you perceive as being a different race. The biological differences that create visible differences, skin, hair, eyes, are truly only skin deep. Race, including whiteness, is actually a state of mind. But it's a state of mind with profound consequences. Nothing could illustrate this better than the story of Gregory Williams. Williams is a law professor and has been the president of two universities. He looks about like the kind of guy Hollywood would cast as a university president. White, balding, glasses, suit. Until age nine, he says, he lived a comfortable life as the son of a wealthy white Virginia restaurant owner. He attended whites only schools, skating rinks, and theaters. He bought what he wanted when he wanted it, and he felt sure that he'd be able to make his life whatever he wanted it to be. There seemed to be no barriers for him, and he took this for granted. Until the year he turned 10. That's when his father's alcoholism and physical abuse became overwhelming to his mother, and she fled with as many of her children as she could handle, which was just the two youngest ones, leaving Williams and his brother in their father's custody. The fall from there was precipitous. His father lost his entire fortune. They lived on the run from debt collectors, and when they couldn't scrounge up a meal from dumpster diving, the father begged for quarters to buy the boys a school lunch, which would be their only meal of the day. Harsh, harsh poverty. Eventually, they boarded a bus from Virginia to Muncie, Indiana, and Williams was relieved, thinking that they were going to see their mother's mother, who would take them in and save them at last from the poverty. But as they approached their destination, their father leaned over and quietly said, Remember Miss Sally? Williams did. Miss Sally was the black woman who cooked for them sometimes. Well, she's my mama, and she's your grandmother, he told the boys. Williams couldn't believe it at first. He had been taught that his father was Italian or, or maybe Greek, it was always kind of fuzzy, he remembered now, now that he thought about it, and looking more closely at his father, he realized that it was true. His father was the son of a black woman, and according to America's one-drop rule, this made Williams black, too. And so when they pulled into Muncie, it was to the black part of town. Now Williams and his brother were black. They lived in a black neighborhood, and they went to black schools and black pools and black theaters, and other people treated them as though they were black. They had access to the same resources or lack of them that other black people in that town at that time had. And like other black people, Williams and his brother were shut out by that white grandmother they had so hoped would help them. She even called them the N-word. Miss Sally, for her part, was too angry and hurt 
by their family's earlier rejection of her to tend to the boys who had landed in her care, and she didn't have enough money to feed them anyway. When they applied for government assistance, they were told that the boys had a father who could work and provide for the kids, and it wasn't the government's fault if he didn't. The boys often went hungry. Eventually, it was Miss Sally's friend, Miss Dora Serene, who showed them love and kindness, and though she couldn't fix their poverty or her own, she shared the bits of food she brought home from her work for a white family. And that's how Williams carried on through the remainder of his childhood. In the Hebrew scriptures, in the section called Judges 12, there's a story about an ancient battle. In it, the leader Jephthah rallies his fellow men of Gilead to fight the Ephraimites. Ethnically, the two groups were related. The Gileadites and the Ephraimites both had Semitic ancestry. Their heritage was so close, actually, that nobody could tell who belonged to which group just by looking. So after the men of Gilead had prevailed, they had to come up with a clever way to figure out which survivors were friends and which were the enemy. Here's what they did. Guarding the way to Ephraim, they set up a checkpoint. Whenever a man tried to pass through, the soldiers made him say the word shibboleth. Shibboleth. Shibboleth, the men said. But when one said sibboleth, he was killed on the spot. You see, the Ephraimites had an accent. Sibboleth was the way they would say it in their regional dialect. Shibboleth has come to mean a password or a catchword or a formula adopted by a group for the purpose of including their followers and excluding all others. Race has become a shibboleth, a formula for excluding people who are actually like the excluders. We see it playing out today in white norms of beauty, in economic and criminal justice discrimination, in access to health care and education, Prohibition was rooted in racism against Irish and Germans who were displaying their culture by creating pubs. Today, the racism is reflected in comments like the fear of a taco truck on every corner. <laughs> May it be so. <laughs> There's a name for all of this. It's white supremacy. That's a hateful phrase, isn't it? It, when I hear it, it sounds like something that is far away from me. When I hear it, I think of some of the boys and the men that I imagined I was getting away from when I left the small rural Oregon town where I grew up. White men with violence in their eyes. But that outward violence is only one manifestation of white supremacy. And we still have, long after Jim Crow was the explicit law of the land, some de facto segregation. Churches are still some of the most segregated spaces in our country. Our church reflects that sadness, too. We have proportionally more people here who think of themselves as white than you'll find in the community outside our doors. We have not figured out how to overcome it. And I know you want to. How often I've heard members of this congregation express a longing for more diversity here, for our congregation, which is gathered out of reverence for life and a deep love for fellow human beings and for this world, to finally deeply reflect the human community of which we are a part. And to that I say, if we truly value diversity, then the first task, the first task, is not inviting new people to show up. The first task is for this congregation to become deeply committed to dismantling racism. Especially within ourselves and also within society. We all have it, including me, because we have been steeped in it since we were born. We have begun that work. Sermons like this are a part of it, and over the last couple of years, our diversity task force has held workshops, book groups, and other events with a total attendance of nearly 150 people. But we could use some more members, especially people of color, on this team. And if you could see yourself in that role, I would love to talk with you about it. I did my ministerial internship in Concord, Massachusetts, where Emerson lived. 
at First Parish in Concord, where Emerson's grandfather pastored and which Emerson attended. I stood at Emerson's grave there in Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. All around it lay the headstones of other townspeople, and if you know some of the backstories, what is striking about it is how many of them hated each other's guts, <laughs> only to wind up being even closer neighbors in death than they were in life. We humans are all in this together. Let us devote ourselves to learning and loving one another in the time that we have in life together, that we may leave a better life for the generations that follow. Our closing hymn is We Are Not Our Own, number 317. <laughs>